Uh, the cover of Lolly's game is just a. Uh, it's this uh, weird oh, the... animatronic child thing peeking yeah, out from a doorway definitely. with someone yeah. in a leather jacket sitting right behind it. Not right, sitting, right. standing. Yeah. Um. I don't really have any big predictions uh, for this book because I have no expectations. Just that things will be spooky and there will be android children, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, alright, so the first story is Frailty. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the night was cold. Raindrops scattered across the road like tiny pellets. The flash of red and blue emergency lights reflected off the wet pavement and the wreckage of a crash sedan against a broken tree. Come on, kid. Stay with me. Stay with me! Jack the EMT whispered. Drops of rain rolled off his face while he pumped his hands against the ribcage of a teenage boy. Clear! His partner, Dave, yelled. <laughs> Jack raised his arms as Dave charged an electric current into the boy's heart. The boy's body jerked on the wet gravel road. Jack started pumping the kid's chest again. Come on, kid. Come back to us. Send no post, Jack. It's been too long. We gotta call it. Once more. Come on, kid. Again, they tried to revive the boy, but to no avail. Dang it. Jack sat back, wiped rain and sweat up his nose with his wrist. Call it. After a moment of regret, Jack covered the kid with a tarp. He stood up, gave himself a minute. It was always painful to lose someone so young. He heard a rock skitter across the ground. Jack swiveled his head towards the black brush from behind a tree. Someone there? Maybe an animal? He couldn't see anything through the curtain of rain. He rolled his shoulders, picked up a medical bag, and turned away. Let's back up and get the coroner here. Kid didn't make it? Officer Manor asked him on his way back to the ambulance. Jack shook his head. Not this time. Too bad. This road is dangerous, let alone during a storm like this. Don't I know what the calls I've had here in the past? Jack trailed off as he placed the bag into the van. I, I've been looking this up because I, I was curious, because I know it's like for atmosphere and everything, but I was wondering if you can like defibula uh, use a defibrillator um, on a victim that is wet um, or like in the rain, and it just says like if the victim was like fully submerged. Uh, <laughs> like, don't use a defibrillator, but it says nothing about, like, the rain. Alright, so they got so, that part right. Yay! I guess. Right. Yeah, it is. it says it is safe to use AEDs in all weather conditions. That's just something I was curious about, because, like, I'm not a EMT. I don't know these things. <laughs> Me neither. <clears throat> Officer Manor nudged his flashlight toward the dark, and right here, Near a cemetery of all places. Bad vibes, I think. Just a coincidence, Jack said. A sudden movement caught his eye. Jack squinted against the rain and shifted his attention toward the body. There was a dark form in the rain. Someone leaning over the corpse. For a split second, the hairs on the back of his neck raised. Then he shook the feeling off. He blinked to make sure his eyes weren't playing tricks on him. There was someone. Short. Slim. Frail. The form hovered over the dead boy's body, doing some kind of motion with its hands, back and forth. Then he saw it. A knife. Jack stepped forward. Hey! Get away from him! I'm gonna take a drink real quick. Okay. The way it looks like someone brought a knife to to the party. And like, yeah, and they said that it was a small, so it's probably like that robot child on the cover, I would guess. But it's from La that's for Lally's game. Usually the cover art is associated with story. Uh, yeah, well, like, um, from what I hear of the Fazbear Frights, they kind of have um, like an intro, and then that part doesn't come back up until like, um, like, you read three short stories, and then they have a book end that ties back to the intro that the book started with. Hmm. That's that one... typically how it's... 
I wonder if they're doing the same for the Pizza Plex books, though. Um, it, maybe. Like, they're supposed to be, like, short stories, like, frights, right? So I would think maybe. The dark form jumped up, long wet hair covering a face, light glistening off the weapon, and something swinging from the figure's hand. Then the little thing ran away back into the darkness of the brush. What happened, Jack? Officer Manor asked, scanning the darkness. Jack pointed toward the dark brush. I saw someone, leaning over the body. It, uh, it was uh, another kid, I think. Maybe a girl? Officer Manor walked around, shifting his flashlight around the scene. He came back with a slight twist on his lips. You sure about that, Jack? A young kid walking around in this? How long's your sift been? Jack shrugged the shoulder. Going on 24? Yeah, I needed some sleep. Maybe I shouldn't have mentioned the cemetery. Got you thinking of spooks in the night. It's only kidding around, you know? Jack went back to the kid's body and picked up the last medical bag. Maybe he was imagining things. The tarp moved. Jack jumped. Holy heck, Dave! We got a live one! What? The kid! He moved! Get the gurney! You sure? Just get over here! Jack tore the tarp from the boy. Saw the kid's face smeared of blood. Watched as the kid coughed. Sucked in air. The kid moaned. Help! Jack whipped out the portable oxygen and slipped the air mask over the boy's mouth. It's okay, kid. Breathe. We got you. Nice and easy. You've been in an accident. We're taking you to the hospital and they're going to take good care of you. Do you remember the accident? The boy gave a slight nod. Driving a little too fast in the rain. Wrapped around the tree pretty good. Hang in there, kid. You've just been gifted a miracle. <clears throat> Question. uh, questions, and I don't know if they're going to answer this or not. Was, like, the kid the only one at the scene? If it's a car crash and they're a minor, like, who was driving the car? That is a good question. I mean, maybe they mean yeah. kid as in, like, a 16-year-old, and 16-year-olds uh, tend to have, like, licenses in some states. Uh, it, it, yeah, maybe. Or this could be, like, uh, <laughs> going off the deep deep end of the theory. Well, maybe this is just, like, a parallel universe of the Gregory ending where he drives off in a car. <laughs> <laughs> just means Freddy ditched him. It's just Gregory crashes the car and Freddy just bails. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, continue. Alright. Star, star, star. Jessica pushed the wet mop across the hospital floor, to and fro, to and fro. She remembered that saying from somewhere before. She just didn't remember from where. Something from the past. A shudder ran through her as her hands trembled on the stick of the mop. She tightened her grip so it would stop. She felt the hospital staff walk by her. She felt them look at her. She still threw her head forward so her thick black hair curtained her face as much as possible. Not to be seen, not to be noticed. No one said anything to her more than necessary. She did not speak to them unless spoken to. She performed her job each day after school and mopped the floors of the children's medical ring. She grew accustomed to the scent of sanitizing cleaner and the dismal order of the sick. She listened to the murmurs of the staff. She paid attention to the beeps of medical machines hooked up to sick children. She studied the various footsteps she heard on the hard tiles. Sometimes soft steps. Sometimes clicks of heels or stomps of bigger people. Sometimes the steps were rushed. Sometimes they were slow. She was aware of each and every child in the hospital wing. She often heard crying and whispers of conversations as she cleaned the floor. The doctor says you're doing really well, Brian. You're eating better. Treatment is going well. That's wonderful, son. A woman's voice spoke from the patient's room that Jessica was near. Yeah, I guess so, Brian murmured. Hang in there, sport. You'll be better before you know it, the man said. And then you'll get to come home and rest in your own bed. 
I have been feeling a little bit hungrier. That's so good to hear, woman said. When will I get to go home? I hope so soon, son, said the man. When you do, we'll get your favorite pizza from Freddy's Mega Pizza Plex. We'll dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we'll make it a celebration. How does that sound? Pretty good, actually, the boy said. The man laughed. That's my boy. Bree, spoke the woman. What are all these strange flakes on your chest? Huh? Look, Harry. What are these? My gosh, what kind of hospital did we bring him to? I don't know. They look like little bits of silver, the man said. Relax, Jane. I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation. They've been taking good care of him here. You even said so yourself. He even looks better today. I know, but... The woman called out of the room. Nurse Macy, please, can someone come to my son's room? Yes, Miss Herman. Is Brian okay? Nurse Macy asked. Yes. But what is this strange stuff on my son? I don't want anything on him that is going to make him sicker. Hmm. I don't know what that is. The nurse went in and checked Brian's chest and brushed the strange flakes off him. I don't think it's anything serious, Mr. and Mrs. Raymond. I have staff sweep it up and get some new blankets. Please, I don't want any cleaner or anything on him that is going to harm his recovery. Yes, Miss Raymond, don't worry. We would never let that happen. Jessica pushed them off slowly across the hallway. To and fro. To and fro. Brian has dandruff. Leave him alone. <laughs> Silver dandruff. So, so, well, like, when they said, what are these strange flights on his chest? And, like, I have eczema, so I have strange flights all over my clothes all the time, everywhere. So I'm just like, leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make fun of him for his skin condition. <laughs> it's a skin condition. <laughs> all right. Star, star, star. She's so strange, that one. The nursing assistant murmured to Nurse Macy as they were stocking supplies on a medical cart. Hmm? Jessica, you mean? Quiet. Keeps to herself. Never makes any trouble. Nurse Macy shrugged. Nothing wrong with that. Well, she's so frail. Looks like a feather could knock her over. They're always covering her pretty face. He shuddered. Creeps me out the way she lurks around. It's not normal. She's obviously alive, and yet she's not really living. Nurse Macy shook her head. You've been watching too many horror movies, Colin. How do you think people come up with these scary movie ideas? They see things that freak them out and write about them. I'm sure you were at an awkward stage at 14. Wait, Jessica's 14? What, she's like... Maybe she's working part time. I I'm not sure because like the way I don't know. I thought I Jessica gave me the impression of someone like in their early twenties or something. But if they're fourteen, I guess they're fourteen. <laughs> We're not talking about me. Besides, I talked to people. I tried asking her something the other day, and she just looked at me and blinked like I spoke an alien language or something. Nurse Macy sighed. Oh, Cullen. Clang. Just then, something dropped from behind them, making them jump. Colin let out a childish, Eek! Nurse Macy glanced down to see a rusted tin can lying on the hospital floor. She frowned. That's odd. Where did that come from? She murmured. She glanced left and right and spotted Jessica mopping not far from them. Oh, Jessica, would you mind picking up this can and throwing it away? I don't know where it came from. Must have dropped off a kitchen cart or something. I'll have to tell them to be more careful with their garbage. Jessica gave a silent nod, and, dragging the mop, picked up the can and threw it in a nearby trash can. Thank you. Oh, and Jessica? Jessica slowly lifted her head, her hair parting to reveal her delicate features. Her eyes were dark. Didn't they used to be a brighter brown? wondered Nurse Macy. One small beauty mark was dotted high on her left lovely cheek, but her skin seemed to have lost some of the rosy flush it once had. Her lips were delicate and full. Her face was slim and so pretty. 
She really could be featured in magazines. You're doing a good job for us. Nurse Macy gave her a small smile. Jessica smiled, and it seemed to brighten her despondent features. I'm glad. Jessica spoke quietly, but the glad didn't reach her eyes. I bet you're a big help at home with your family. Do you help with the cleaning around the house with your mom or dad? Nurse Macy watched Jessica merely nod and turn away to continue mopping down the hall. I'm telling you. Creepy. Colin said under his breath. Nurse Macy just waved her hand at him. Oh, hush. She's just a young girl and you're a grown man. I think you could take her on if she attacked you. Colin shuddered. Don't be so sure. Even though Nurse Macy joked to Colin, she could admit to herself and not explain why. The peering into Jessica's dark gaze nearly broke her heart. I'm guessing she's dead. And she's a walking corpse. She's either dead or a or a walking corpse, or uh, there's uh, possession, or there's uh, she just has social anxiety and is autistic. Or Purple Guy 2.0. Mm-hmm. And by that, I mean just a bunch of animatronic parts inside a human meat suit. Or, or she's Fazgoo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Star, star, star. On her break, Jessica walked into the hospital chapel. The room was empty of grieving family members. She liked it that way, to have the chapel all to herself. It was rare, but it was peaceful and quiet and allowed her to pray. She ran her hand softly over the wooden pews that lined the walkway to the altar and chose the first seat. At the front of the room was a large wooden cross hanging on the wall. She smelled the fresh white flowers set out for display on both sides of the room. There were three rows of small candles waiting to be lit. Quiet, instrumental music played through the wall speaker. She pulled the thick silver chain that hung around her neck from beneath her shirt and lifted it over her head, placing the pendant in her palm. The pendant had once been a whole heart, much larger and thicker. Now it was slightly bigger than a crescent moon, about the width of her thumb with the rough scratches embedded on one side. Nearly finished. She clasped her hands around the pendant and closed her eyes. Please help me do good and continue with my purpose. Please help me make a difference. Please help me help others who are sick. Give me strength to right my wrongs. Give me the courage to do what's right. Thank you. Hello, miss. Are you doing okay? Jessica blinked and stopped praying. She hadn't heard anyone enter the chapel. She looked over to see the priest standing beside the pew. He wore a black suit with a white collar. His hair was dark with streaks of gray, and his eyebrows were thick with kind brown eyes. There were tiny lines beside his eyes when he smiled. I'm fine, she responded quietly. My name is Father Jeremiah. Jeremy! <laughs> Jeremy number nine. Jeremy, take a drink. There's a Jeremy. <laughs> My name is Father Jeremiah. I've seen you here before. What's your name, miss? Jessica. Jessica cast her gaze down and rubbed her thumb across the pendant. Is there anything I can help you with, Jessica? Jessica shook her head. No, thank you. Father Jeremiah took a seat on the pew across from hers. You look pale, Jessica. Are you feeling okay? Is there something I can get for you? A snack? Some water? Should you be resting? I feel fine, I think. I probably look better when I'm working. Working? Here at the hospital, in the children's ring. I help keep the floors clean. To and fro, to and fro. Nurse Macy says I'm doing a good job, she added. She hoped she was doing a good job. This job had been the perfect opportunity to get closer to those who needed her help. It was rare for her to come across others who were sick in the outside world. She heard the car accident last night by chance. A miracle, some might call it. She heard the terrible screech of tires, the harsh crash of the car against the tree. It had taken her time to get there through the heavy rain. She had watched the ambulance come and the EMTs try to save the boy. They hadn't been able to save him. But she had. She was glad she'd been there to help. She'd cut it close, though, and nearly been caught. She could never allow that to happen. 
Ah, yes. I know Nurse Macy. A very caring nurse. Father Jeremiah nodded. I'm sure you're doing a good job. He cleared his throat. You know, Jessica, some people come here asking for help in their prayers. And I often listen to those who have burdens to release or healing to experience. Expressing our worries, our problems, helps us let go of what is heavy on our minds and hearts. Jessica simply said, that's nice. She felt she was already letting go of something very important in her own way. She never shared her thoughts to anyone because no one would be truly able to understand what she was going through. If you ever feel the need to talk to someone, I am here nearly every day to speak with, should you choose. I'm happy to help in any way I can. Jessica nodded her head, keeping her eyes downcast, as she rubbed the pendant with her thumb. What is that lovely charm you have there? Must be very special to you. Jessica merely continued to rub her thumb over the pendant and didn't speak anymore. After a moment, Father Jeremiah said softly, Peace be with you, Jessica, and left her alone. After a few more moments of prayer, Jessica slipped the chain back over her head and rose from the pew. As per her usual routine, she went to one of the single hospital restrooms. She locked the door and walked into a small mirror above the sink. She inspected the dark circles under her eyes and the paleness of her delicate skin. Some might think she was lovely, but the truth was she looked frailer each day. Being lovely was once all she had ever wanted. She could feel the weakness take over her body with each child she helped, with each scrape of the pendant. She wore a black sweatshirt and black pants, and even black sneakers. Black wasn't a welcoming color. It kept people away from her. It helped her to remember that she wasn't there to enjoy life, but had to stay focused on her purpose. From her pant pocket, she removed a compact powder. She opened the lid and patted the soft applicator to the powder and dotted her face with the concealer. It was a pretty soft ivory that gave her a fresher look. After she put the compact away, she pinched her cheekbones to give herself a little color. Her eyelashes were naturally dark and thick, and her lips full and pretty. When she used to smile, people would smile back at her and be interested in what she had to say. Jessica used to feel that certain things were important, like how she looked. The best clothes, the coolest friends, the cutest boys but they actually weren't as important as she had once thought. Now everything was different, and she never smiled unless she had to. Jessica left the bathroom to return to work. The lights were dim for the evening, and the staff had quieted down. As she pulled the mop and rolling pail from the cleaning closet, she heard the faint sound of cartoons playing nearby. Setting her mop aside, Jessica followed the sound to a new patient's room. A little boy with brown hair was curled up on his side, asleep, holding a green stuffed elephant. He was alone. Jessica turned to glance behind her and saw that no one was looking in her direction. She walked quietly into the room and pulled her chain over her head, grasping the pendant. She slipped her knife out of her back pocket and opened the blade. If someone walked in, they'd think she was trying to hurt him. No, she would never dream about hurting anyone. She wanted to help him the only way she could. She never told anyone about her purpose of helping those who were sick. Others wouldn't be able to understand. She hadn't understood either, until she received the shock of her life that she was no longer the girl she had once been. Beside the bed of a little boy, Jessica began scraping roughly at the pendant with her pocket knife. Little shavings of silver drifted down on the boy as he slept. As she scraped, her chest seemed to tighten. Her pulse slowed and her breathing became shallow. These feelings in her body were how she knew she was helping this little boy heal. When she felt it was enough, she slid the chain back over her head, and the pendant once again under her shirt. Close the blade, put the pocket knife away. The little boy blinked his eyes open. Blue eyes gazed at her with interest. Are you an angel? He whispered. No. She whispered back. I'm no angel. Go back to sleep. But I'm not sleepy. Jessica's lips twitched. Her eyes looked pretty sleepy to me. I think if you were close your eyes and count sheep, soon you'll get the rest you need to make yourself strong. He scrunched up his nose. Sheep? A sheep? Okay, what would you like to count then? I think I want to count... Elephants. I like green elephants. Okay, you can count elephants. Go ahead. Close your eyes and count. 
The little boy closed his eyes as he said, one green elephant, two green elephants, three. Soon he drifted back to sleep. Jessica turned to leave and nearly stumbled as a wave of weakness washed over her. Something skittered across the floor. She held onto the door flame and balanced herself as the fainting feeling went away. She licked her dry lips and spotted a rusted spring just by the doorway. Her eyes widened. She quickly snatched up the spring and walked out of the room to finish her work for the evening. Interesting. So it's a magic pendant that's slowly stealing her life force. But I have no you idea what can... the rusted item has to do with anything. Because that's the second I rusted don't... thing. I, I don't know. A spring appeared, so I immediately think spring trap. But I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, but... Right now, the image uh, in my mind of who Jessica looks like, I think that she looks like Hana Chan from Fruits Basket. I, I was thinking of Samara from the ring. But obviously not wet and drenched. Just like the pale skin and the long black hair that's constantly covering the face. Yeah, yeah. Star, star, star. Take another drink. Jessica sat alone at a lab table in science and engineering class at West Wilson High School. She preferred sitting alone, but it always seemed to happen naturally. No one dared to sit next to the weird girl who barely spoke, barely participated in their world. She felt tired and distant. Miss Willoughby was droning on about mm -hmm. a new project. And if she let herself, Jessica could drift off to another place in her mind away from this present reality. She wasn't sure why she continued to go to school. Maybe it was to keep up the pretense. Her old life was now far behind her. There really was nothing here for her other than she didn't want to make things difficult by drawing attention to herself by missing school or even getting bad grades. She really could do without the many scents of perfume, body odor, junk food that surrounded her every day. Mood. The boring lectures, the teenage gossip, the stares from teachers and students, not to mention the overall loudness of school, pounding feet, yelling voices, slamming lockers, music playing, cursing, crying, and laughing. So much noise! So many constant reminders of kids her age who are normal, with friends, teenage problems, and families at home who loved them, even if they didn't always remember to be grateful for them. If Jessica had a home once, she'd had a family. She'd had everything, and one day she gave it all up by making the wrong choice. There was one thing Jessica had learned in her life. It was that some choices couldn't be reversed. The only thing to do now was to move forward the best that she could. Look, it's the creepy girl. A sudden whispered behind her. Someone giggled. She barely speaks. What's the matter with her? Another girl wanted to know. She's like a mannequin who barely moves. Mark Johnson says she creeps around the graveyard. Oh my gosh, like a freaking zombie! Would have thought West Wilson High would have had its own walking dead. Jessica didn't say a word. She'd heard it all before. Zombie girl. Mannequin. Dark witch. The walking undead. Although she did her best not to draw attention to herself, she still did. Just not the kind of attention she used to receive. She'd become the target of mean gossip. Teasing. Sometimes pranks. Overall, she was a loner. A girl was often avoided as she walked school hallways or sat in the cafeteria at lunch. It suited her just fine. The more she was avoided, the easier it was to check out of this present high school reality. There were a few more whispers from girls before something small hit the back of her head and dropped to the floor. More laughs erupted. It was some laughs from the surrounding students. Jessica smoothed her hair down with her hand, unbothered. Girls! Miss Willoughby scolded. Her problem? Miss Willoughby was on the younger side as a teacher. She wore dark rimmed glasses and often sported a black ponytail. She was one of those teachers who spoke with her hands and was eager for class participation. She seemed to leave Jessica alone, though. One of the girls cleared her throat. No problem, Miss Willoughby. I would hope not. I think you girls would rather be out with your friends at lunch than helping me clean up the science lab today. No, we're good, Miss Willoughby. Thank you. You're so kind. Now, may I continue without being rudely interrupted? Yes, Miss Willoughby, the girls answered together. 
At the lab table next to her, the boy picked up the used eraser that had bounced off Jessica's head. He tossed it back at the girls. Real mature, he muttered. What's his problem? The girl whispered back. He's new. He doesn't know the reality of the zombie girl. Jessica glanced at the boy and then looked away. He was indeed new to school. Okay, class, choose your partners, Miss Willoughby announced with a clap of her hands. Make sure to choose someone you know you can get work accomplished with instead of someone to goof around with until the last minute. This will be 50% of your quarter grade, so make it good. Jessica blinked. Choose your partners. What had she missed? The new boy stood and came to our table. Hi, he said. Want to be partners on the project? Jessica swallowed hard. She supposed she had to. It wasn't like she'd get another offer. She nodded. He sat next to her in the empty chair. I'm Robert. Jessica. This project's going to be kind of cool, huh? Jessica slowly nodded, unsure what it was about. She hadn't been paying attention. Robert had an athletic build, with honey hair, hazel eyes, and golden skin. He wore a pale blue collared t-shirt and faded jeans. There was a braided leather bracelet on his right wrist. He was the kind of boy from whom she would have wanted attention in her old life. Now she wished she was invisible. He transferred from out of town, he continued. My dad is an engineer and got a new job here. He was excited about this class for me. Robert brushed his hair back with his hand. Were you excited? Jessica flinched. What was she doing? She's supposed to keep to herself. Yeah, it's fun, you know? Building stuff. This will be my first time in a class like this. Jessica nodded. She used to think building stuff was fun, too. Those girls were acting dumb, he said quietly, with a shrug of his shoulders. There were girls like that in my other school. Never hung out with them. Just mean to everyone for no reason. They think it's cool, I guess, when it's not. It doesn't bother me. He lifted his eyebrows. Really? That's cool. Most people wouldn't say that. Then he smiled. I can't believe we get to build our own mini-robot. Jessica stared off into the distance. Oh. Perfect. I've only known Robert for five seconds, but I'm prematurely awarding him himbo of honor in this story. <laughs> <laughs> He's a himbo in training. <laughs> Stars, stars, stars. After school, Jessica was seated at the table in the school courtyard, waiting for Robert. They'd had a couple of class sessions to plan the bot project and decided to make a mini rolling bot that carried items on its back and was controlled with a remote. The catch was they had to have the tray lift up and down. Robert had taken apart an old remote control car and discovered the components to make their bot active. Robert dropped the cardboard box on the table, causing Jessica to recoil pulled out his old remote control car. I asked Miss Wallaby how much we can use from this on the bot. She gave me a list of what we can and can't use, Robert said, handing Jessica the paper. Today, he wore a pale yellow shirt that buttoned down the front with gray sweats. Jessica wore her typical all-black outfit. Jessica took a list he handed her. We need to find the other components for the ones we have to replace. Yeah, I know. What are you doing later? Miss Wallaby wants us to salvage as many components as we can instead of purchasing them. Maybe we can go to the junkyard and see what we can find. Jessica quickly blinked a few times. Um, I know we need a couple of springs. Something to be used as a tray. Maybe old wiring. I, I can't. She stumbled out. Huh? Robert looked at her with a slight frown. I can't go there. I, I have to go to the hospital. To work. I forgot. Robert shrugged. Oh, well. You can go another day. We have time. No. Jessica said a little too sternly. She could feel her insides being the shake. She started to pack her notebook into her bag. I have to go. Robert stared at her with surprise. Now? I thought we were going to work on the project. We made a schedule. We should keep two if we want to finish on time. Can't stay. Tomorrow. You go to the junkyard, okay? It's not my thing. All right. It's for the project, you know. Not like I like to hang out at the junkyards, either. Uh, are you okay? He grabbed Jessica's wrist, and Jessica pulled away as if stung. Are you sick or something? 
You look a little pale. I don't feel well. Do you want me to walk you home? It's not a problem. I can come with you. Maybe you shouldn't be by yourself. No, I don't need help, okay? I'll see you tomorrow. She grabbed her bag and quickly rushed from the table. She felt faint, as if she could just kill over it any second. She managed to make it off school grounds and lean against a tree for support. She grabbed her pendant with a shaky hand and closed her eyes. Her breath filtered out of her mouth quickly. Everything is going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. After a few moments, Jessica managed to calm her breathing. She licked her dry lips as she settled down. She didn't know what had come over her. She'd learned to study her emotions or at least mask them from others. She couldn't let her emotions erupt like that again. It made her too vulnerable. And when she was vulnerable, she couldn't think straight. She set off towards the cemetery. The wind had picked up and was blowing her hair wildly. The cemetery had become her sanctuary in the recent months. A quiet, peaceful place. When she stepped into the cemetery, she often stopped to read the headstones to get familiar with the souls who had been laid to rest. She wondered about her own grave, what her stone would read. It was more than likely she would never get a burial. She strolled through the graves. Her mind drifted back to Robert. She hadn't really met a boy so kind and confident before. If she let herself, she could start to like him, which was not possible now. Maybe in her old life, she could have opened herself to having a true friendship. Maybe something more. But that all changed the day she made a choice. And each day, she was doing her best to make up for that choice. She had a purpose now, and she was sticking to it. She made her way to the farthest and oldest of family crypts. There, hidden among the graves, was a small mausoleum made of stone. Dark, stained glass windows. Old, dried vines covered the top and hung down the sides of the structure, patched with white cobwebs. She gripped the rusted handle and leaned her foot on the bottom of the door, pushing with everything she had in her. The heavy door creaked open, scraped along the floor. Dust particles twirled in the sunlight. She pulled out her small flashlight and stepped inside and pushed the door closed until she was surrounded by dark. She switched on the flashlight and walked to the back of the small enclosure passing what she assumed were a family of dead people named Holloway, then turned around a corner to a small sitting area that she was made of stone. She cleared all the cobwebs of, of as many spiders as she could manage in this little hideaway. The groundskeeper neglected this section of the cemetery since the graves were over a century old. She kneeled down on her sleeping bag and grabbed a pack of matches to light three yellow candles placed off to the side. She stripped her book bag and sat on the sleeping bag and pillow. Here, she could let down her guard. No one could see her. No one could judge her. No one could wonder about her at all. She was safe for now. Next to her, she had a duffel bag of her signature black clothes. A small overnight kit with some makeup, a hairbrush, a toothbrush, and toiletries. She kept her life simple. Minimal. She had one small item from her old life. She reached in the bag and took out a white rabbit's foot. I let Dago from her finger on the short chain. She used to carry it with her everywhere, thinking it brought her good luck. Now she didn't believe in good luck, but it was a reminder of who she used to be and who she would never be again. She lay down in the sleeping bag and let herself rest before work. Hmm. Mm. Well, well, like, I was building a theory in my head, and... The rabbit's foot might connect to it, maybe. Um, but I think that she might be paranoid of the junkyard because it has to do something with those springs, but I don't know what. Um, maybe she found but... a spring bonnie suit and something, something family did. Well, like, what I'm thinking is that this might be a character who's um, an an android and her own parts like inside of her is robotic and she maybe she might be an android of um a younger vanessa but vanessa is blonde so that doesn't work but i don't know <laughs> i'm just spitballing who knows let's find out star 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 
Jessica noticed Nurse Macy was humming under her breath at the nurse's station while she was performing her mopping duties. It was mindless, really. Mindless in a weird kind of way. Weird was the theme of her life these days. But what really concerned her was the fatigue that weighed upon every inch of her body. Her grip on the mop was shaky. Even though she moved at a slow pace, she was tired. It was a bone-deep exhaustion that had been becoming more and more frequent each day. She used to have so much more, more strength. Now she often wished for the time when the pendant had been a whole heart and she'd been full of energy. The truth was, she'd been busy the last few nights with the patients. She lifted a shaky hand to the pendant that lay under her shirt. It was definitely smaller now. Thinner. A tremor of fear vibrated down her spine. She lifted her chin. She could do this. She held herself. With as much strength as she could muster, she continued to push the mop. To and fro. To and fro. Hi, Jessica. It's a lovely day, isn't it? Nurse Macy mused, a wisp of a blonde curl shifting on her forehead as she walked over to her. Nurse Macy always wore scrubs in shades of orange, blue, green, or purple. Sometimes the patterns had fuzzy characters or animal prints. Today there were cats making silly faces on her top. Her smile was welcoming, even though Jessica did her best to keep her distance. Nurse Macy had this energy that pulled others towards her. Jessica nodded. You want to know why it's a lovely day? Nurse Macy asked. Jessica paused and looked at her expectantly. Most of our patients in this wing have improved in some way, she said with a bright smile. They are eating and smiling. Most times there is a heavy sadness that you feel around this floor. But now, today is a good day. When there are smiles and meals being eaten and pain has decreased, it's like magic. In my line of work, you have to take the wins when you can get them, Jessica. You remember that. Take the wins when you can get them. Jessica liked that. She'd remember that advice. Nurse Macy gazed into Jessica's eyes. How are you feeling today, Jessica? Jessica looked away. Good. That's nice. Anything new going on in your life? How's school? Jessica's grip tightened on the mop. Nothing's new. Everything's good. Glad to hear it. Well, duty calls. See you later, Gator. Jessica watched her wave off to visit another patient. Even though she enjoyed being around Nurse Macy, it was getting harder to avoid her direct questions about her personal life. She suddenly saw the nurse come to a halt right in the middle of the floor. Sheesh, what is going on with all this junk? Jessica, there's an old fork on the floor. Do you mind cleaning up? Between this and the weird flakes? Dang it, she missed another one. Okay, Jessica answered. Jessica slowly walked to the old fork and picked it up. A fork? Really? She said quietly. Then she rolled her eyes and tossed it in the trash. That was when she noticed someone new. There was a teenage girl for about her age. She was lying in a bed, wearing headphones. She had red hair and tiny freckles speckled across her cheeks. She solemnly played with the phone in her hand. There were three empty jello cups on her side table. Jessica pushed her mop pail closer to the room, and the girl noticed her. She pulled off their headphones. Hey, she said to Jessica. Hi, Jessica said. You work here? Jessica nodded. The girl frowned. Why would you want to spend your free time around sick kids? Because I want to help them. It's a job, she said instead. What's your name? The girl asked. Jessica. I'm April. I was admitted early this morning. I'm not handling my treatment well this time around. You probably see a lot of kids like me around here. Sometimes, she said. Doesn't it bother you being around like this? She waved her arm around her. Jessica shook her head. Am I supposed to treat you differently? No, but a lot of people do. You don't know how many times I see looks of pity or sadness and sometimes fear. Like if they are near me long enough, they might get sick too. I don't see that in your eyes. They stared at each other for a few moments. Then Jessica said, You've got to get back to work. Okay, um, you should stop by sometime. I'll be here, unfortunately. Being lime jello. Jessica nodded as she pushed her pile away. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think when she does like the shaving thing, something metal appears. Maybe. So far. Some form of garbage that's rusty. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 
I'm gonna take another drink of water. My throat's getting dry again. Yeah. yeah. Some some weird equivalent exchange going on. That'll either probably all make sense at the end or not. The obvious thing is that it's draining her life. Well, yeah, no, that's apparently obvious. Although I don't know what's the appearance of rusted springs and forts, though. Yeah, that's that just seems kind of random. Just since it's the pendant that she's shaving things off of. When I hear white rabbit's foot, in this franchise they always connect, like, rabbits to Wh William Afton, but, like, I think that they're trying to connect it to Vanessa because they mentioned it was white. I don't know. You mean Vanny? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Vanny, not Vanessa. <laughs> My bad. Star, star, star. I got some spring, wiring, some bolts, and metal slats. What do you think about this tray? It's an old one, but it's cool, right? Robert said to Jessica as they sat at a lab table in class. Just the right size from the mini bot. Jessica sat quietly looking at the items Robert had apparently salvaged from the junkyard. She wanted to knock all the dirty junk off the table. But instead, she sat still like a statue. Unmovable. Motionless. As if the sight of the old garbage didn't bother at all. You're not saying much, Robert said there. Jessica met his eyes, saw the curiosity, and looked away. Yes, these will work fine. Great! After the other day, I thought maybe I'd done something wrong. Maybe I didn't want to be partners anymore, he shrugged. It's kind of late to find new partners. No, I, I told you I wasn't feeling well. She unclenched her fists and pointed towards the tray. This is just the right size. You did a good job. I know, right? Robert pushed his hair back with his hand. I got excited when I found it. This bot is going to be so cool, Jess. You just wait and see. Jessica froze as she heard the old nickname that her closest friends had once called her. She felt a lump form in her throat, and she swallowed hard. She hadn't known how difficult it would be to interact more at school with Robert on this project. It was taking so much willpower to keep her in her seat and not run from it all. Reminding her of the past and bringing more of it into the present was not what she wanted. Miss Willoughby strode by their table with her notebook to mark off their progress. Nice, Robert and Jessica. You are both pulling together your components in time. I like your initiative. She looked over the blueprints they had put together. Looks like your bot is coming together. Good job, you two. Let's see you start to build over the next few days and make some progress. Okay, Robert said with a smile. Jessica nodded. How do you feel about the project, Jessica? Miss Willoughby asked her directly. Jessica balked. Miss Willoughby usually avoid talk speaking with her. Um, I feel good. It's going to be good, she replied awkwardly. How do you like working with Robert? Jessica glanced at Robert, and then back to the pieces at the table. Good, she mumbled. He's a good partner. So is Jessica, Robert piped in. She's worked really hard helping me with design and keeping us on track. I'm glad we're all good then, Miss Willoughby said with a small smile. I'll check back with you in a couple of days about your progress. Keep up the good work. Miss Willoughby walked to the next table. Jessica could feel her shoulders relax. Robert rubbed his hands together. Excitement lit in his eyes. Let's get started, Jess. Jessica watched Robert set out a few components for the structure of the minibot. She was very aware that she hadn't yet moved to help. Set out four metal slides that would connect for the framing of the minibot. Three of the metal pieces were obviously old and from the junkyard. One piece looked fresh and newly purchased. Go on. Pick one up. She chilled herself. But she couldn't bring herself to move past her hesitation. The used parts were dirty and old, and sunk of rust and grease. It reminded her of things she'd rather forget. But she knew she couldn't avoid this forever. She couldn't just have Robert do all the work on the minibot. That wouldn't be fair. Detachment was her greatest defense. Sometimes she envisioned her feelings as if she was a possum. When a possum felt it was endangered or threatened, it froze into a catatonic state. Jessica imagined her feelings being just like that. When she was strong, she could manage to shut down her inner feelings until the threat was over. Right now, she was the possum. Her aversion to this junk did not affect her. In fact, she was very much frozen inside until the threat to her feelings had passed. She slowly reached for the dirty metal slates. She felt the cold steel in her grip, and she brought it toward her. She stared at it and turned it over and examined the rusted edges. 
She could touch anything from the junkyard and be okay. It would not harm her or affect her feelings. She set it back down, rubbed her fingers against her pant leg, and exhaled a deep breath. Success. Hmm. Mm. What do you think? Still no idea. Something. <laughs> I, like, I don't know if it's my hyperfixation brain talking, but I'm wondering if they're trying to either draw a connection to Fanny or Vanessa, because I know that um, Vanessa's nickname is Ness. So Ness, Jess. No, no, her, her, her nickname is Nessie. I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, but, like, um, she signs off her emails in uh, FNAF AR oh, as yeah, Ness. Oh, yeah, yeah, Okay. N Nessie was something that uh, Witchy came up with. I don't think that's canon. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> star, star, star. Nurse Macy was checking on Billy's vitals. Color had come back to his cheeks, and his appetite had increased, which in turn gave him more energy. Doing so well, Billy, she told him. You're eating all your meals like a big boy and taking your medicine. I am a big boy, he declared as he zoomed a toy airplane over her arm. Yes, you are. Hey, Nurse Macy, when will I get to see the angel again? Angel? Nurse Macy asked with curiosity. Yeah, the angel helped me feel better. Oh yeah? How did the angel make you feel better? She came to me in the night, and then I felt better. I'm not, how sh I'm not sure how she did it. She must have used magic. I like her. I want to see her again. Wow, that's pretty cool. You must have a guardian angel looking over you, Billy. Billy lifted his little fists up in triumph. Yay! I have a little a guardian angel. As he shifted, tiny specks flooded off his blanket. Nurse Macy spotted the flakes of silver with dismay. What was this stuff? She quickly brushed him off of Billy's blanket. Yes, you are a lucky boy. I'll check on you later and bring you some pudding. How does it sound? Yum! Chocolate, lucky. please! You got it. Lucky boy, traumatic flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> the worst oh, story boy. ever. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's so bad. Yum, chocolate, please. You got it, she said. I'll be back in a bit. Just then, there was a loud clang from outside Billy's room. Nurse Macy started. What in the world? She walked out of the room, and in the center of the hallway, she found a piece of a car muffler. Mm -hmm. Frustration coursed through her. This is getting ridiculous. Who is playing these pranks? She spotted Jessica mopping nearby. Jessica, did you see someone drop this? Jessica's eyes widened. Um, no, I didn't see anyone else in the hallway. Well, somebody thinks they are funny, and they're not. She said a little loud so the culprit would hear. So they better stop. Please, Jessica, grab me some gloves and throw this garbage out. I'm trying to keep a clean floor here. If I get a surprise visit from the IR Hups and they find this garbage around, we'll be in big trouble. Jessica nodded and hurried toward the janitor's closet. Nurse Macy frowned. She called and checked with the nurses on the other floors, and no one else was seeing junk left around in their areas. It was just in the children's ring for some reason. She decided to take a walk around the floor to see if she could spot any more tricks happening around the patient's rooms. She turned down the corner, and sure enough, she found a couple of greasy bolts. Disgusting. Nurse Macy gritted her teeth. When she found out she, who was doing this, she was going to give them a good scolding on how dangerous it is to leave industrial objects on the floor for someone to trip over. Not to mention how insanitary it was for her sick patients in the hospital. She might even turn them over to the hospital security to give them a good scare. She slipped on her rubber gloves that were stuffed in her pocket and picked up the bolts and continued on until she found a small rusted can. She swept that up, but she's still down. Then she found herself right in front of the hospital chapel. Was the culprit inside? She wondered. She jumped the junk in a nearby trash bin, along with the dirty gloves, and stepped inside the pe to peaceful music. There was an old woman sitting in the center of the pews. But Nurse Macy couldn't imagine that she was the prankster. She stepped further in and walked to the front of the pews, looking around for anyone who might be suspicious. Hello. Father Jeremiah stood from behind her. Nurse Macy jumped and put a hand to her chest as she turned. Hello, Father, she said quietly. Sorry, didn't see you. He lifted his thick eyebrows. 
How are you today, Nurse Macy? I am doing well, Father. How are you? I am well. Coming in for a visit? She began to nod, then her face heated from the fib. Well, I'm looking for someone who has been playing some pranks around the children's floor, leaving pieces of garbage around. Nothing serious, I hope. It could be. So I need to put a stop to it. I can't seem to figure out who it is yet. I'm sure you'll discover your truth soon enough. She nodded. I hope so. Father, by the way, there's a young girl named April on her floor. It would be nice if you could visit her and put her in your prayers. She could use some cheering up. Thank you for telling me. I will do that. How is our friend Jessica doing? Nurse Macy smiled. Oh, you know Jessica. She's doing okay, I think. She does a good job for us. He frowned. I worry about her. So frail. So quiet. I've been praying for her lately. She visits here often. That's nice, Father. I worry about her, too. She could think. Nurse Macy nodded. I think so. Father Jeremiah smiled. Well, peace be with you, Nurse Macy. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Father. Same to you. I hope you discover your prank, sir. Just remember to go easy on whoever it is. Everyone has a story that we don't yet know. Yes, Father. I remember that. Nurse Macy sighed as she started to return to work when her foot knocked against something. She bent down to pick it up. She narrowed her eyes at the discovery. It was a rusty lock. So the rusted objects are, like, definitely getting bigger. Still have no idea what they mean, though. Yeah, no. <laughs> star, star, star. Jessica sat on a chair in Robert's dad's workshop as Robert soldered some wires into the minibot. The workshop was pretty neat, she thought. Shelves with labeled boxes lined one wall. There was a work table that sat against the opposite wall, and another work table in the center that Robert was working on. She stood on this other side of the table, wearing goggles. She had felt hesitant having this next meeting at his house. It was too close, too personal. But Jessica knew that they had to work together to get the minibot completed, and the next step had to be soldering the minibot's guts together and the arm that made the tray go up and down. Robert turned off the soldering tool and lifted his goggles. I think I've got it. You know, Jess, we really need to agree on a name for this minibot. I like calling it minibot. Even though Jessica hadn't intended to be funny, Robert chuckled. Minibot? The MB, huh? Yes, we could just give it a number, like the Minibot 5000. Robert made a face. Not very original. Robots aren't always original. Sometimes they are just made from boring old junkyard scraps. A heavy sadness suddenly came over Jessica. She clenched her fist. She really thought she'd gone over the sadness and pain of her predicament and had settled on overall acceptance. But lately, emotions and feelings have been coming back at the weirdest moments. Why now? What had changed? It's not always about where things started from, Jess. It's about what you make of all the pieces once you have them. Jessica frowned. My dad told me that once, and it always stuck with me. Remember, he's an engineer. He's always creating something out of pieces. Knock, knock, said ah. Robert's mom as she entered the workshop, holding a tray with a plate of brownies and two glasses of milk. I thought you hard-working engineers could use some body fuel. She had honey blonde hair, just like Robert. She was shorter, and her face softer. Jessica noticed they had the same welcoming smile. Mom set the tray on the side work table. Thanks, Mom, Robert said. Jessica thought she should say something, too. Yes, thank you. I hope you like brownies and milk, Jessica. Do you have any allergies? No, I don't. Good. Enjoy them. I look forward to seeing your finished minibot. Robert's mom left. And Robert grabbed the tray and brought it over to their table. He set it down, grabbed a brownie, and took a bite. These are the best, he said with a mouthful. My mom is an awesome baker. Try one. Jessica was hesitant to take one. She watched Robert chew his brownie and gulped on some milk. Truth was, she used to love brownies. They were her favorite dessert. She never treated herself anymore. Never allowed herself to enjoy sweets or anything that connected her to her old life. She believed she didn't deserve any of them. Any <laughs> she believed she didn't deserve them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> she 
she believed she didn't deserve them anymore. Come on, you know you want one, Robert said to her. Jessica tilted her head to the side. I guess I can have one. Are you not supposed to eat sugar or something? Um, not really. Jessica reached for a brownie. She could already smell the cocoa and butter. She took a small bite and closed her eyes. The brownie tasted heavenly. Oh my gosh, that's really good, she murmured, enjoying the sweet treat. I told you, the best. Baking is one of my mom's favorite hobbies. Um, you know, Jess, Robert said, you haven't told me much about yourself or, your, or about your family. What do your parents do? Jessica blinked. He never asked. Well, and I'm not much into sharing, she interrupted in order to sidestep the conversation about family and took another wonderful bite. He smiled. I can couldn't tell. I don't like other girls. I know. <laughs> I'm not trying to be conceited. I just know that I'm different. Weird. I'm not like other girls. <laughs> God damn it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't call you weird. I mean, other girls I've met like to talk themselves. Sometimes too much. We're about a lot of drama. We handle things differently. Quietly. It's nice. Jessica didn't know what to say. Anyway, he continued on and cleared his throat. You know I'm new here, and I don't have many friends. Yes. You heard about the prom coming up? She nodded. I'm not a junior. I am. Jessica met his eyes, and Robert seemed to blush. He brushed a nervous hand across his hair. I wondered if he would like to go with me. What? To, to the prom. I thought it would be fun to go together. Jessica stared at him in shock. A brownie half-eaten in her hand. She was actually speechless. She'd worked so hard to separate herself from school, from others, to be as invisible as she could to make herself. Now she met a new boy, strangely didn't think she was weird and wanted to take her to prom like a normal teenager. It's in a week, he said, quickly, to fell the silence. Do you think you'll have to work? Maybe you can request it off. Um, his cheeks reddened. I mean, if you want to go with me, unless you were already asked, who would ask zombie girl? No one's asked me. Robert smiled. Then, what do you say, Jess? Would you like to go with me? Dun dun dun. I knew he was a himbo the moment he came. <laughs> I forget, is Junior Prom six? How old? Wait. She's 14. Yeah. I'm, I'm just confused. So she's freshman, it, it didn't... sophomore, junior, senior. I'm guessing either freshman he's or either... sophomore. Like he's either like three or two years older than her. Like that's that's not that bad. No, no. I'm just trying to figure out what grade she's in because it said she was 14 at the start, but she's in high school. So it's kind of confusing. Right, right. Maybe she just has, like, um, a late birthday. I mean, like, I was in my freshman year of high school when I was uh, 14, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. Star, star, stars. That night, Jessica rushed into the hospital chapel. Her heart was beating fast. For the first time in a while, her goal was skewered, as if she couldn't see the finish line anymore. It didn't feel good at all. She sat down on the first pew, stared off into space. She didn't know what to do. She left Roberts awkwardly, telling him if she had to find out if she could get the night off, she'd let him know. And she'd come straight to the chapel for guidance. She pulled the pendant over her head and clenched it in her hands, closing her eyes. Please help me know what to do. Please guide me. I never thought this would happen. I'd made a plan. Now things have changed. I did my best to keep to myself and do the right thing, and now everything seems to be falling. Should I pray with you, Jessica? Mother Jeremiah asked from beside her. Jessica swallowed. I don't know. I mean, if you want. Father Jeremiah sat next to her. For a few moments, sat in silence. I don't know what to do. 
Jessica finally spoke to Father Jeremiah. She stared down at her pendant. I always believed this pendant gave me strength, so that when I worked around the sick children, I could give them a piece of it to help them, too. I had thought I had found this job for that reason, to help others, to redeem myself for the bad choice I'd made in the past. Now things are changing, and I find myself wondering if it's okay to give myself again by having some of my own life back. Something normal. I'm not sure if it's okay, though. And the worst part is that I had been so certain that I was on the right path. Why do you feel you can't give to yourself, Jessica? Because of the past, the tremor remembered through her body. The past. The past. The horrible past. I... I just didn't make the right choice. I mean, that's how I got where I am. I gave up everything. So there had to be a good reason for that, right? Now I'm asking just for a little piece back. Not something so big, really. Just a little thing for myself. Is it too wrong to ask? Jessica looked down her pendant. It was so slim now. Barely anything left. Was she too late to ask for something in return? Did she even deserve to ask? Why didn't she have an answer? Of course not. We do work for others. We have to be open to receiving as well. If we overgive, we become out of balance, and we can make ourselves ill or sad. Giving to others is a great gift, but yes, Jessica, giving back to ourselves is a gift as well. God loves all his children, and he wants everyone to feel happiness and love. Jessica looked at him directly in the eyes for the first time. Is that really true? How do you know? Father Jeremiah lifted his eyebrows. Because I know it in my heart to be true. Stars, stars, stars. It, hmm? It's eerie how much of this uh, mirrors my life in high school, but I'm wondering if this is just everyone's life in high school. It's pretty much everyone's life in high school, because this is mine too. Other than the, besides <laughs> the whole living in the cemetery thing and sacrificing bits of my soul to heal sick children yeah. bit, that, that, that yeah. part's not my life. No. Yeah, no, not, not that part, but like the anxiety, the feelings about school, feelings about boys, uh, feelings about religion, of all things, in a FNAF book. <laughs> I'm still curious where this is all going. I still yeah, have no. no idea. No, me too. I like I have no idea. I mean, I threw out a few theories, but I think they're just so far left field from what actually will happen. So yeah, we'll have to see. Star, star, stars. Father Jeremiah watched Jessica slowly stand and leave, her head bent down in sadness. Poor child, he thought. He wished she could be of more help to her, but he knew from experience that he couldn't save everyone. He could only do his best to guide them. He began to rise when he looked down at the floor and found a metal circle with spikes in the edges. He picked it up, studying the objects. Some kind of gear, it seemed. That's odd, he thought. He frowned and glanced at the door Jessica had just exited. Stars, stars, stars. But was that from the robot they were building, or was that just another manifested garbage piece? Well, I thought that, um a piece of metal or something would appear when she does that, like, silver scraping thing with the pendant. But she didn't do so, any scraping. Well, like, that's what I'm saying, because this is kind of like um, a, a close third person and detached third person at the same time. So I'm wondering, like, if she did, but she did the scraping to, like, heal her for herself, and that'll be addressed later, or it just appeared because it appeared. I don't know. Hmm. Well, we'll see. <clears throat> Jessica walked back to the children's floor. The lights were lowered for the evening. She could hear the beeps of machines and oxygen blowing air. Most of the kids were asleep. However, April was still awake. Come in here, Jessica. I see you. April called to her. Jessica had tried not to be noticed. She wasn't doing such a good job of that lately. She stepped into April's room. Hi. Where's your mop? April wanted to know. Still in the closet. 
There was a beat of silence between them. The cancer in the blood, if you're wondering why I'm here, April told her. I figured. There were dark circles in her eyes, like the ones Jessica had covered up with makeup. I'll be losing my hair again soon. All will be the new me. Jessica didn't respond. You're pretty, I said, setting her. Tell me about your school. Your life. I've been in and out of school for the past couple of years. I miss out on a lot of stuff. To me now. They don't know what to say. They don't think I... They think I don't want to hear about how much fun they're having. But I do. I used to play basketball. I'm athletic. Or I used to be. But I wouldn't give to run down to the court and shoot baskets again. But now I can do that in my imagination. So you tell me. Please... Just for a few minutes, help me be a part of your world. Jessica grabbed her pendant hanging from her neck and rolled it back and forth in the chain. She knew she didn't really have a life. Not the one she really wanted. But if embellishing a little about how wonderful her life was would help April, then she would try to talk about herself. Leaning against the wall, Jessica told her about Robert and the minibot. She told her how nice and kind he was to her when others hadn't been. But the project was halfway complete. Now he just asked her to prom. April listened with a smile and a few questions thrown in. With swoons over Robert and the possibility of going to prom. Maybe one day I'll get to go to prom, April said. I can dream, right? You will go to prom, Jessica said, if you believe it. I can picture it. I would be completely healed. My hair would be full and healthy. I think I'd have a bright pink dress or a green one with matching shoes. I'd go with a nice boy like your friend Robert. I'd dance all night and laugh with friends. Maybe I'd be part of the royal prom court. We would all go out together somewhere, like the beach. We'd run around a small campfire and talk about our dreams. The stars, the moon would shine down on us. And maybe the boy would give me his coat because I was cold. Then when it was quiet... And we were alone, he would give me a kiss under the stars. Best night of my life. Jessica pictured the scene along with April. But instead of April, it was Jessica having the best night of her life at prom. Jessica felt herself yearn for a wonderful, normal experience, just like April had described. I'm tired now. April lowered herself on the pillar and closed her eyes. We'll talk again sometime, Jessica. Okay. Jessica clenched the pendant as she looked at April. She could help April, she thought. Was she supposed to help everyone? Father Jeremiah's words drifted into her head. Giving to others is a great gift. But yes, Jessica, giving back to ourselves is a gift as well. With guilt heavy on her shoulders, Jessica quietly drifted back into the dark hallway. Th this has nothing to do with the story. But I just broke my fidget toy, and now I'm upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> Me pretending to be a kid with cancer, bemoaning about wanting to go to prom, you in the background just crying over your fidget toy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm crying over my fidget toy, because I really like this one, and I've over fidgeted, and now the peg won't, like, fit in the hole. <laughs> So, now I'm upset. I'm sorry. <laughs> that I'm ups more upset about my fidget than, the than what's happening with April right now. I'm sorry. I was joking. I was joking. I just find it funny to imagine, like, I'm just, like, pretending to be this, this sick cancer patient child, and you're just, like, being a grumpy butt behind me. <laughs> just being all <laughs> sad about your fits. You, uh, you, like, have that stereotypical, like, hand over your chest, like, oh, you, you like, you poor dear, and, like, I, I'm just crying in the background. <laughs> my, my fidget toy is broken. <laughs> Believe it or not, I actually have been, like, with my hand on my chest this entire time I've been reading. <laughs> I don't know why I just do that when I'm reading. <laughs> We're horrible. <laughs> oh, 
I'm going to take another drink because my face is hurting now from laughing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. That's funny. Yeah, no. It's fine. Star, star, star. After school, Jessica and Robert were ready for the first test run with the minibot. Robert wanted a quiet place so other students wouldn't bother them. Jessica suggested the cemetery. The day was sunny. The cemetery was fairly empty of visitors. You are right. It is pretty quiet here, Robert said as he looked around. Yes, almost peaceful, Jessica said as she led him to a far empty section of a parking lot. How do you end up finding this place? He asked. Jessica blinked. Um, well, his eyes widened. Oh, do you know someone buried here? Jeez, I'm sorry. Oh, no, never mind, she said, not having an explanation that he would understand. Let's just get set up. The small bot was melded together with various metal parts from the junkyard and the remaining at the hardware store. The flat tray on its back, the arm had been fused together with an aluminum tubing with the wires tucked inside. It was not yet painted or officially named, but it was ready for trial run. Robert set the mini bot down and then placed the soda can on the back of its tray. Okay, Jess, this is our first test run for the mini bot 5000, Robert announced. Jessica's eyes widened. You named it after my choice? I thought you said it wasn't original enough. Yeah, but it's the best name we have. And MB deserves one. So, Minibot 5000 it is. Ready to take some notes? Lately, being with Robert and experiencing his kindness, Jessica felt an unfamiliar warmth inside her when she spent time with him and when he made nice gestures to her, like choosing her name for the Minibot. She couldn't really remember the feeling this way before. Or maybe it had been so long that she'd forgotten. She wasn't sure if that was wrong or not right. She knew she enjoyed the feeling good. She nodded. Notebook, check. Okay. Switching on the Minibot 5000. Turning on the remote. Here goes nothing. Robert pushed the knob on the controller forward. There was a pause. Then, mini, then the mini bot shifted an inch forward and started rolling. Yes, it's working! Robert shouted. Jessica smiled as excitement for creating something new rushed over her. We actually did it! Okay, here goes the ultimate test. Robert pushed a button on the remote, and the tray rose slowly, and the tray shifted back down. All right, he said with excitement. The lift works! Robert directed the minibot 5000 to turn right and then left then back around to stop in front of Robert's feet, right before the wheel surprisingly fell off. The Minibot 5000 fell to one side. The soda can tipped over and fell to the ground. They stared at the wheel as it rolled off to the side. Then they laughed. We can fix that, he said, and smiled at Jessica. We succeeded with our first run of Minibot 5000. We make a good team, partner. Jessica nodded. Yes, she took a deep breath. And Robert? Yeah. Something fluttered in her stomach. I would like to go to prom with you. Robert's smile got bigger. You would? Awesome, he said. I'll get the tickets tomorrow at lunch. I can meet you at your house before the dance. Um, no, I can meet you there. It'll be easier for me. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, okay. We can go eat afterward if you want. I don't know all the good places to eat yet, but maybe you can tell me your favorite? Maybe. Just let me know what color your dress will be as soon as you know, so then I can try and match the tux if possible. Depends on what's available at the rental. Color of the dress? Oh, okay. Alright, great Jess. It'll be fun. You want to do the honors and get this wheel back on Minibot 5000? He offered her the socket wrench. Jess gave a small smile and took the wrench. Sure. Hmm. They go in on a date. Things are starting to look positive, but, hmm. Stars, stars, stars. Nurse Macy watched Jessica mopping the floor. Something was definitely off. Jessica stared into space, barely moving. Usually her head was down, as the girl was doing her best not to be noticed. And today, it was like she was in a trance. Nurse Macy recalled what Father Jeremiah had said. 
She could use a friend, I think. Jessica, are you okay? Nurse Macy asked her. You need a break? What about some water? You could be dehydrated. Jessica blinked. No, I'm okay. Are you sure? Jessica nodded. If you need help with something, please don't hesitate to ask. Jessica stared at her a moment, and Nurse Macy began to feel like Jessica would forget to speak when she finally blinked. I am going to prom, she said. Nurse Macy smiled, happily surprised. That's wonderful! Who's the lucky boy? His name is Robert. He's my science partner. I bet you're excited. Jessica didn't answer. Is there something else bothering you? Nurse Macy asked her. She wished she knew what was going on in her mind. I've never been to prom before. I don't know what to expect, and I don't know what to do about a dress. Nurse Macy looked at Jessica with compassion. She wanted to ask her, what about her mom or dad, or sibling or a relative? But she felt those personal questions might shut down Jessica completely at this vulnerable moment. She didn't know Jessica's personal story, but she understood Jessica was fragile and secretive about her life. There appeared to be a sadness about her that never seemed to go away. Deep trauma usually was the cause of that in the kids she cared for. Nurse Macy always had this drive within her to help others, especially caring for the young. Even though Jessica wasn't a patient, she could tell the girl needed her help. Do you need some assistance in that area? She asked her softly. Jessica stared at the floor for a moment. Then Nurse Macy watched her nod her head up and down. It was very hard for Jessica to ask for help. And Nurse Macy felt a glow in her chest that she trusted her enough to ask. I'm happy to help you, Jessica. I have an hour-long lunch break soon. We can go right to the department store, and I'll give you some advice and address. How does that sound? That would be... Good. I'll grab you when it's time. Fairly normal. What? Fairly normal. Things are going fairly, fairly normal. normal. Nothing. Fairly normal. Squints. And suspicion. Never... <laughs> Oh, oh my god. Um, okay, thought. Um, what if, like, they go to prom and then, um, either, because, uh, like, either one or two things happen. Like, if they'll either, like, be bullies and we'll have, like, a carry situation, like, with the pit's blood or whatever. Or, like, um... Uh, uh, a a car engine will like fall from the sky on Robert's head. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> like those are my two thoughts right now. <clears throat> well, we'll have to see. Stars, stars, stars. Jessica stood in a slim, ankle-length lilac dress in front of a mirror in the fitting area of a department store. There were pale flowers etched into the design. The material was soft on her skin, and beneath her fingers as she brushed her hand down her hip. She couldn't recall feeling a dress so soft before. She tried on a few before this one. There have been so many colors of dresses. Pink, white, blue, yellow, red, and black. Short dresses and long ones. Off the shoulder or with thin or thick straps. Puffy skirts or straight ones. Dresses that glittered or shined. She wanted to wear black, but Nurse Macy convinced her to try something with color. Jessica hadn't looked at the price tag, but she hardly used the money she got from the job at the hospital. She had plenty of savings to buy a dress and some shoes. Jessica, you look stunning, Nurse Macy said in her gleeful way. Jessica really looked at herself. She lost more weight recently, but she was still pretty, with her high cheekbones and full lips. Her hair was still thick and shiny. Her shoulders and arms looked delicate and low dress. In the mirror, she saw her lips curve. Just for a moment, she could believe she was a regular girl buying a dress to go to prom with a boy she liked and who liked her back. That her life was normal and perfect. I think I like it, she said with a small smile. I do too. Let's get you some shoes to match. Deep down, Jessica knew this was like a fairy tale and everything could burst and go back to the way things were soon enough. She'd asked Father Jeremiah to allow herself to have something for herself. He seemed to think it was okay. 
To her, Father Jeremiah represented life and death and forgiveness. He had to know what was right and what was wrong. Right? Because now Jessica felt uncertain and fragile, feeling she didn't feel comfortable with at all. Nurse Macy brought over a matching pair of simple purple shoes. What do you think? Jessica slipped them on, and her height went up two inches. They fit. Not only do they fit, but they're perfect. You're going to look beautiful in prime night, Jessica. And you're going to have such a wonderful time. Can you walk okay? Jessica tried to walk and felt a little clumsy. Oof. It's not as easy as it looks. I've seen lots of women wear heels, but they walk so naturally. Nurse Macy giggled. They were once like you. With some practice, you'll get the hang of it in no time. Just know it's normal for your feet to feel a little sore, especially after dancing. Don't ask me why we wear these things and torture ourselves. But they make our feet pretty. Look pre But they make our feet look pretty, don't you think? They do. Jessica glanced at Nurse Macy in the mirror. She gave her tips on how to walk confidently. Nurse Macy had always been kind to her, thus she was kind as to all her patients. What other people at the hospital avoided Jessica? Nurse Macy always tried to talk to her. Now she was here helping her when Jessica most needed it. Once upon a time, in her old life, Jessica may have considered her a true friend. And had she been a normal girl, she very much would have wanted to be a nurse just like Nurse Macy. Someone she admired for her positive attitude and the way she cared for her patients. Bringing joy to others who were ill truly was a gift, just like the kind Father Jeremiah talked about. Your family will love the dress you've picked out, Nurse Macy said, touching Jessica's gaze in the mirror. Um... Jessica said she tried to think of a response. She supposed a typical parent would have loved seeing their daughter in a pretty prom dress, but that wasn't the case for Jessica. She tried to think of something to say, but her mind went blank. A sales lady walked by them in the fitting room and stopped. Wow, your daughter looks gorgeous. Is this for prom? Jessica and Nurse Macy locked eyes in the mirror, and Jessica had no idea how to respond. She simply looked down at her shoes her hair shielding her face. She does, doesn't she? Nurse Macy suddenly said, Yes, it is for prom. This is the perfect dress. We will definitely take the dress and the shoes. Jessica raised her head and blinked in astonishment. She didn't question why Nurse Macy didn't correct the sales lady about being her mom. She guessed it didn't really matter. Explanations took too much energy sometimes. It's better just to let others see what they wanted to see. As Jessica continued to look at herself, she let hope spread inside her for the first time in a long time. Prom night was going to be perfect. She got adopted. <laughs> I'm guessing Nurse Macy connected the dots with her silence and how she looked the yeah, way. Yeah, like and like how she's not going uh, prom dress shopping with like her parents because like prom dresses are expensive and like really fancy things that usually the parents buy. I remember my mom and I going to like all sorts of stores before eventually she just made me one herself. Mm. Like I I think I bought one second hand at the store because like when it's the season for them you can find all sorts of like prom dresses in a thrift store and I'm probably going to donate my old, old prom dress because I gained a lot of weight and it doesn't fit me anymore so why not neither does mine <laughs> <laughs> all right stars 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 after a shift nurse macy wanted a nice hot meal while watching one of her favorite tv shows she vowed she would get that soon enough it had been about a week since she'd taken jessica to buy her prom dress and she'd been warring with herself about what she should do should she leave well enough alone and let Jessica's business be? Or should she take action to help her? She'd finally decided to take action. Nurse Macy rechecked the copy of Jessica's work application that she'd submitted to the hospital and tried not to let the guilt get to her for invading the young girl's privacy or violating HIPAA. She read Jessica's address and put it into her phone's GPS app to guide her to Jessica's home. She felt she was doing this in Jessica's best interest by getting down to the truth of the teen's family life. Nurse Macy felt if she knew what was going on at home, then she would be able to help her. Maybe speak to her parents or her guardian, 
explain her worries about Jessica's health and demeanor. Perhaps even let them know that Jessica needed some help emotionally. Jessica was a wonderful girl. She deserved family support for things like prom. She deserved someone to care about her. She deserved to be happy. Nurse Macy knew Jessica was hiding something about her home life. She wasn't sure what it could be. Yes, she had a habit of sticking her nose where it didn't belong. But that was what made her a darn good nurse. She investigated the facts to better help her patients. And with Jessica, it was no different. When Nurse Macy sought to help, especially when the poor girl had to ask her older co-worker to help her get a pro dress for prom, where was her mother or father? Or her guardian? Why wouldn't a 14-year-old have someone to turn to? It was so sad and she just couldn't stand it. A few minutes later, she drove down an older section of town. Some of the street lights were burnt out, and she could see many of the homes were run down. There were a couple of boarded up windows with graffiti sprayed across garage doors. Turn right on Cemetery Lane, her app relayed to her. Nurse Macy turned right. The night was clear, the stars shined above the town. She drove past the cemetery, and looking at the dark gravestones, felt the shiver crawl down her spine. The poor girl lives near the cemetery, she realized. Down at the end of the road was the last levitated house in the block. Your destination was on your left. Nurse Macy pulled along the sidewalk and parked her car. She got out and clicked for a car fob to lock the doors. She took a deep breath and pulled her coat closer to her neck against the cold of the evening. She would simply explain to Jessica and her family that she was worried about her and wanted to make sure she was okay. Then she would ask to speak to her guardian alone to explain her worries. She didn't want to embarrass Jessica, after all. She walked up the cracked walkway to the door. The light was dim, and she could see the light on the inside through the curtains. The paint was chipping off the house and the door. Nurse Macy knocked. She heard a little dog bark and footsteps before the door swung open. An old woman with glasses stood in the doorway. She had curlers in her hair and no teeth. Nurse Macy could tell by the way her lips were pursed. Her skin was she wore an old robe, the color of gray storm clouds. Yes, the old woman said as she squinted at Nurse Macy through her thick glasses. Hello, my name is Nurse Macy. Nurse? I don't need not check you. Had one just the other day. Shush up, Pepsi, the old woman said to the little barking dog. Oh no, I work with Jessica. Are you her grandmother? Nurse Macy could understand clearly why Jessica didn't have the support she needed. If she was living with her grandmother, she likely had to take care of this woman rather than the other way around. What'd you say? Don't have my hearing it in. Can't hear as good as I used to. Nurse Macy leaned in closer. Jessica. Is she here? May I speak with you about Jessica? Jessica. Don't know no Jessica. Nurse Macy blinked in confusion. She stepped back to look at the house number. Um... Is this 333 Cemetery Lane? Yes, but you must have the wrong house. No Jessica here. Now I need to get back to my shuttles. Don't want to buy nothing either. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. The door was shut in her face. And the porch light turned off. Nurse Macy sighed in frustration. Where in the world are you, Jessica? I need to get back to my soaps. <laughs> 333 three, three Cemetery Lane, huh? Very subtle! Very subtle three, about the death numbers there, yes! A three is a death number? Triple three. Triple three is a death number. Why? Because sit, sit, sits. Uh, no, let me look it up real quick. I forget why. I remember reading it. 333 three, three, three meaning. Okay. There's a lot of speculation surrounding the 333 angel number. Some believe that it has metaphysical significance, while others claim that it is a code for death. However, the truth is that we do not know much about it. What we do know is that the 333 angel number is associated with death. That is because it is the number of angels that are said to be stationed at the gates of hell. Additionally, Ooh. it is believed that 333 is a symbolic number for the devil. While the 333 angel number may have some metaphysical significance, it is also understood to be associated with death, 
As such, it is important to be aware of its implications if you are thinking about dying. Ooh, spooky. Also, I hope you don't mind, but I accidentally skimmed ahead and we might be finally getting into the FNAF of this FNAF story. <laughs> <laughs> don't spoil. I still haven't. I'm, I'm still going in blind. I have no idea what's happening. I just saw a single phrase, so don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> star, star, star. In total darkness. Her surroundings were completely quiet except for her breath. There was a coldness that penetrated her skin, straight to her bones, and she shivered. She touched her bare arms, and then her closed. She felt the material of her prom dress. Why am I wearing my prom dress? She wondered. Where was she? She put her hands out in front of her, trying to feel her way forward. But she saw nothing in front of her, nothing behind her. Fear crashed over her. She was nowhere. Had she died in her sleep? Was this what the afterlife was like? Was she in some kind of in-between world? But she couldn't have died, she realized. It wasn't yet her time. She still had to go to prom. She still had to help April. She felt for the pendant and gripped the metal that always felt warm to the touch. It was still around her neck. She started to walk forward with, flo with slow, hesitant steps. She didn't know how long she walked. It seemed like forever. Out of nowhere, she finally heard a creak. A footstep? A movement? Hello? She whispered. Someone there? Please, if you are there, say something. I'm afraid. I can't see anything. Please. I don't know what to do. No answer. She licked her dry lips as she continued to move forward, trying to get somewhere. Anywhere. Is there a wall? A door, maybe? Another sound came from around her. Metal creaking against metal. Eska froze as awareness dawned. No. Sound happened again. This time right behind her. A shudder of terror radiated down her spine. She rushed forward as fast as she could, with her arms waving around her, wondering if she would collide with something. Metal footsteps stomped behind her. Quickly. Too quickly. So close. So close. She blinked, trying to adjust the dark, but she could still not see anything. In the cold, sweat broke out on her body as she ran trying to escape the terrifying thing that chased her. A tense grip curled around her arm. Jessica screamed, No! Please! Get away from me! Someone! Help me! Quickly, the grip tore off her arm from her shoulder. Oh. Mm. Ah! I did not expect that. <laughs> she felt the warm gush of blood rush down the side of her body. Her body vibrated in shock. Her mouth opened, gasping for air. Then she felt the grip on her other arm. Jessica tried to yank away when she felt her arm pulled from her bone. Jessica fell down in pain and agony. It seemed like it took forever to collide with the hard, cold ground. She heard more creaks and movements of metal above her. And then she felt something cold grab the pendant on her neck before it was torn away from her. No, don't take my pendant away! Jessica jerked awake with a frightening scream. She was in her sleeping bag on the stone floor in the mausoleum. She pushed against the stone bench at her back and grabbed her mini flashlight, flicking it on. Her heart felt like it would be pounded through her skin. She swiveled the light around, looking for anything in the night. She listened for sounds of metal creaking against metal, but she could only hear her breaths filtering out of her mouth and crickets chirping in the night. She saw nothing around her but stone walls. She was truly alone. She touched the pendant against her chest as she calmed down. She was safe. Everything's okay. She said aloud and waited for dawn. When the soft rays of light peered through the colored glass window, Jessica looked around her dark and stale surroundings. And staying in the mausoleum, for the first time she saw it for what it really was cold, dark place for the dead. Not for someone alive. Not for someone who wanted to live. You, 
you know, that's happened to me before. Like when my blanket like twists around me and my and I get all constrained. I have like these weird dreams where like I'm either in a car crash or like limbs of my body are being like ripped off when I'm all like confined or I'm being buried alive or something like that. But that was probably like a prophetic dream or something, because dreams are never just dreams. <laughs> yeah. At least not in narr narration. Yeah, at least not in narration and not in this series. Because <laughs> I think like we've read like a lot of synopsis of Fast Bear Frights where like they have dreams and like they tend to like come true or something like that. I think the one with um uh uh the spring trap baby had a lot to do with dreams the guy falling asleep though at his job i don't think the the dreams were all just nonsense in that one yeah yeah no there's um like the books haven't like um dropped like a factual reason for this but there's like definitely like prophetic dreams that happen throughout uh, um, butts and stuff like that. Stars, stars, stars. The next day, during science and engineering class, it was time to present the Minibot 5000 to Miss Willoughby in the class. Jessica sat next to Robert at their lab table. The Minibot 5000 was sitting on the table between them. They painted some of the parts Robert's favorite color, blue. Jessica held the final written report in her hand to be turned in with a presentation. She felt nervous, which is odd for her. She noticed Robert bouncing his leg up and down. He seemed nervous too. They tested out the Minibot 5000 a few more times. Everything had generally worked. But as they learned throughout the project, something could go wrong at any time. During their other test runs, the Minibot 5000 had burned out a wire, which had to be replaced. The springs had broken and needed to be fixed. And now the final presentation was here. For better or for worse. Jessica wanted Robert to feel better. She took something out of her book bag and held it in her hand while they listened to the other students' presentations. When the class clapped, she poked Robert in the shoulder. He glanced at her. Here, it was her lucky rabbit's foot. He lifted his eyebrows. A rabbit's foot? It's for luck. I know we'll do well, but it might make you feel better to have a little extra luck on your side. He smiled as he took the rabbit's foot. That's cool. Thanks, Jess. He dangled the short chain that it was attached to on his finger, which she had done many times before. Jessica smiled back. You're welcome. I have something for you, too. He loosened the braided leather band on his wrist and handed it to her. I'd like you for you to have this. She shook her head. But it's yours. You always wear it. Now I'd like you to have it. Jessica took the bracelet and slipped it on her wrist and tightened the band till it fit. She felt a funny warmth in her chest. Thank you, she said quietly. I can't wait for tonight. Prom's gonna be fun. Jessica felt a nervous flutter in her stomach at the thought of prom. Robert and Jessica, you're next. Robert stood, sliding the rabbit's foot in his pocket. Look, it's Ken and Zombie Barbie, the girl behind them said, and a few laughs followed. Robert ignored them, and Jessica smiled that he didn't let them get under his skin. He lifted the Minibot 5000, and they made their way to the front of the class. It took 15 minutes to discuss their entire plan for the Minibot 5000. Design, the components, the building of the bot, and the trials and tribulations that followed with the test runs. And now let's see the Minibot 5000 in action, Robert announced roller to Jessica to perform the Minibot 5000 presentation to the class. Then all eyes would be would be on her alone. She nearly didn't take it. She was used to being invisible, to being looked over and forgotten. Robert gave her a reassuring smile. You can do it, he whispered. With a trembling hand, she took the controller. She flicked on a switch on the Minibot 5000, and then the remote. Robert grabbed the soda can and went to the other end of the presentation floor. She pushed the knob to move the bot forward toward Robert. Minibot 5000 sputtered at first as usual, then moved towards him. 
She stopped there right at his feet, then flicked the button so the tray elevated. Robert placed the can on the tray, and Jessica flicked the button so that the tray went back down. The can wobbled but stayed upright. She then backed it up and turned the mini bot 5000 around. She guided it to Miss Willoughby and raised the tray for her teacher to grab the soda. Well, thank you, Minibot 5000. I don't mind if I do. Miss Willoughby said. She lifted the soda, cracked open the tab, and took a sip. Yummy! The students laughed. A successful Minibot, you two. Great job. She praised the work as the class clapped along. Robert smiled. And even though all eyes were on Jessica, she didn't care. She smiled back at him. As they sat back in their seats, a girl came up to Jessica and Robert's table. Jessica automatically ducked her head, her hair sliding against her face. Hi, the girl said to Jessica. I'm Tina. Jessica lifted her head and blinked in surprise. Oh, hi. The girl had brown hair pulled back into a ponytail. Jessica noticed her in class a few times. She kept to herself and was often studying alone. Your bot's really cool, Tina said. Thank you, um, I liked yours too. The moving arm, right? Yeah, thanks. I paired up with Blake. He's okay. Maybe next time we can work together. Jessica glanced towards Robert, but he was talking to another student. Yeah, maybe we can, she said. Okay, see you around, Jessica. Okay, bye, Tina. Jessica couldn't believe it. Another student actually wanted to speak with her and possibly work with her on a project in the future. She was the kids avoiding her, and now another student wanted to be around her. She swallowed trying to wrap her mind about and how quickly things were changing. She was afraid she was starting to like the changes. Still not sure if Tina is friend yet. <laughs> stars, stars, stars. After school, Jessica walked by April's hospital room. It was soon, but she'd wanted to come in and see how April was doing. Maybe talk to Father Jeremiah again. She passed by the nurse station, where she overheard Nurse Macy talking to Colin, the nervous nursing assistant. April has a very high fever. We've tried different antibiotics to bring it down. For some reason, nothing's working. Nurse Macy said, clearly frustrated. That sucks, Colin said. She's a sweet girl. Talks to me and asks me so many questions just about my life. Darn it, I feel helpless when the medicines that are supposed to work don't help at all. It's frustrating. I want to help these children, not just comfort them. Jessica gripped the pendant and wondered if she was doing the right thing by going to prom instead of helping April. Seeing April lying in bed, pale and fragile, while she had the chance to make her better seemed so wrong. You can help her after the prom! She had to be perfectly sure she was making the right choice. Oh, Jessica! Nurse Macy said when she noticed her. Jessica stepped forward. Yes? I wanted to talk to you about something important. Jessica blinked. Um, okay? It's prom night, right? Jessica nodded. I want you to have lots of fun. Nurse Macy's face blushed. Um, and well, I tried to go by your home last night to check in on you. But there's an error on your home address you have listed at the hospital. Is it an old address? Jessica blinked rapidly. Oh no. Suddenly, an alert went off in April's room. Nurse Macy jerked her attention away. Call the doctor! She shouted. The Jessica watched in dismay as Nurse Macy checked the machines connected to April. She demanded something of the other nurses. Jessica watched them put a vial of medicine to April's IV. Soon, April's alert turned off. Jessica felt a pressure in her chest. Taking a breath, she heard the chapel to see Father Jeremiah. April was not doing well. Prom was tonight. Her dream was still heavy in her mind. What did it all mean? Was she making the wrong choice? Was she being too selfish? Was she avoiding her destiny? Everything was too much. Pressure to help others, the uncertainty of what to do. She just couldn't handle it. She got to the chapel. Father Jeremiah was speaking to a man who was crying. Father Jeremiah was whispering to him with a hand on his shoulder. Jessica walked to the first pew and sat down. She took off her pendant and held it in her hands. Please help me understand if I'm doing the right thing. I've made the wrong choices before. Do you send me the sign, please, to show me what I need to do? I feel like I just can't do this anymore. Please, I need guidance. But no sign came to her. No answer popped into her head. Jessica felt so alone. The same feeling she had felt when she knew she had changed forever. 
She had vowed to herself she would never feel this way again. It was like she was back to where she had started. Jessica needed to get ready for prom. But she had another important question to ask Father Jeremiah. She glanced with him. She, she glanced at him and saw that he was still talking with the grieving man. She wanted to know if there really was an afterlife. It didn't look like she would get her answer now. She left by giving herself some of her life back. Stars, stars, stars. Prom night had arrived. Jessica's stomach was in knots as she walked into the prom with Robert by her side. Music seemed to bounce off the walls. Kids were chatting and laughing, dressed in pretty dresses and dark tuxedos. The dance floor looked full, and there were still more kids seated at tables. There was a corner set up to take pictures, and long tables lined with snacks and drinks. Chaperones were off to the side, watching the kids dance. Robert had given her a corsage, a pretty white rose with baby's breath, tied with a purple ribbon. Luckily, Nurse Macy had told her about the... I have no idea what the hell that says. Um... Bo but botonary thing? Botonary. Uh, hang on. Hang on. Uh, Google will save me. Uh, oh, it's a boutonniere. It's French. Boutonniere. Okay. Boutonniere. It's, it's like those little, um, those little pin flowers that you put on a lapel. man's lapel of yeah. a tuxedo. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Luckily, Nurse Macy had told her about the boutonniere thing, or she wouldn't have had one for him. Some of the kids who made fun of her stared at her. Jessica hesitated. They likely hadn't expected zombie girl to go to prom, let alone have a date. They were probably waiting for her to do something crazy, like attack them with vampire fangs or something. No, she wouldn't break out in fangs, but she might just fall on her face. Between getting little sleep, doing all the work for the presentation, exhausted, she'd gotten ready at the mausoleum instead of the hospital like she'd planned. Afraid to run into Nurse Macy again and have to answer questions about where she lived. Jessica had no idea what she would tell the woman. She never really had to lie about her life because usually people stayed away from her. In the candlelight, with a small hand mirror, she had to put extra layers of makeup on her face to cover her shallow skin and the dark circles under her eyes. She put on some tinted eyeshadow, and she left her long hair down. Her nerves were practically shot. She was determined to enjoy every minute of this prom experience. Deep within, she felt this could be her last chance to experience something very special. You look really pretty, Jess, Robert told her. She glanced at him and smiled as they walked further into the room. Thank you. You look really nice, too. Who wore a nicely fitted black tux with a light purple vest? The white rose boutonnu was pinned to his suit jacket. Want to dance first, or get another drink? Robert asked. Jessica looked around, wondering what to do first. She wanted to soak up every part of the experience. Let's dance first. All right. Robert led her to the dance floor. They squished in between couples as a slow beat began to play through the speakers. Robert put his hands around her waist, and she put her hands on his strong shoulders. He smelled of a faint cologne that he must have worn just for the dance. She realized things changed for her the moment she met Robert. Over the last few weeks, to some of the experiences she'd never thought she would have had again, such as making friends, being more present in her life, and something as simple as indulging in her favorite dessert. She thought the only way to fulfill her purpose was to keep her distance from others. She thought she deserved to be alone for her past mistakes. But no matter how she tried to stay away from others, it hadn't worked. She'd gotten to know Nurse Macy, Robert, and now she was even making new friends like Tina. And here she actually was at prom. She can believe this is happening. Something good. Something special. For her. Even though she had okay. made it. Hmm? Uh, I changed my mind. Robert is no longer a himbo. He's a manic pitsy dream guy. <laughs> okay. 
is just Prince Charming comes and solves all her problems. Okay. Maybe even though she had made mistakes in the past, she could be forgiven and be deserving more in life. Maybe Father Jeremiah was right about being open to receiving happiness and even love. Jessica and Robert swayed back and forth to the slow music. It was beautiful, really. Even being packed in with so many kids. She could feel herself start to sweat from all the heat surrounding her. It didn't matter, though. It was the night she would always remember. So she could replay this night over and over in her mind as many times as she wanted. Jessica? She looked up into Robert's eyes. It's like time stood still. She leaned down to her ear to speak over the loud music. But I really like you. Getting to know you these past few weeks has been special. When I moved here, I thought it would be the same boring experience at my other school. When I met you, you were different. You made me feel different. He leaned back and smiled at her. She leaned towards his ear. I like you too, Robert. You've helped me come out of my shell a little more. I was used to keeping to myself. I don't have a lot of friends, but you've been a good friend to me. He smiled as she leaned back. I'm glad I could help. And I'm happy you came to prom with me. Me too. The moment passed as they looked at each other. And Robert leaned down towards her. He was going to kiss her. My. She'd never kissed a boy before. Her stomach fluttered. She felt sweat drip down the side of her face. Robert's cheek glided against the dent in the center of her face. She felt his lips brush against hers. Robert staggered back. What is that? He brushed his hand across his face. And Jessica froze. There was dark grease on Robert's face. On his lips. She stood frozen in horror. Grease that was old. Slick. And dirty. And it was from her. No. 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 Something inside her cracked. As if she had been carrying within her this delicate cup of hope and dreams and happiness. Now the cup broke. I, I'm sorry. She gushed out, frantic. Let me help. She reached out to Robert, trying to help him. He jerked away. Ugh. Filthy. He spat out. He swept at his mouth, spit on the floor. Filthy. Jessica stepped back and knocked into someone. Watch it! The girl snapped and looked at her. Her eyes widened. My gosh. This is it, she thought. This was the sign she'd been waiting for. Kids stopped dancing to stare at her. Some pointed at her. Others made faces of disgust. The girls from science class were laughing at her. She made the wrong choice again. Shouldn't have come. A wave of heavy darkness engulfed her. Sounds faded in and out of her ears. Robert, dance, students, decorations. Everything drifted away as if it never existed. That was how it was supposed to be. This world wasn't for her. It was for someone else who deserved it. She could feel herself turning, running, as tears streamed down her face. The blurring music disappeared. The cold night surrounded her. And all she could do was run. Run far, far away. Hmm. Is she a robot? <laughs> We're about to find out. Okay. <laughs> so when is the pizza plex involved in this? <laughs> uh, uh, like, no, that because that's what I'm wondering. Because like they mentioned it uh, to like that kid that she said the kid that was in the car accident uh, mentioned that he would eat at Five Nights at Freddy's but like um oh, no that he would eat at the mega pizza plets but like since then we've had very sparse mentions of the pizza plets and she had a dream possibly of an animatronic rabbit chasing her but like it was very vague on the description of what animatronic it was hmm. so just heavy stomps and clanking yeah just heavy metal stomps for all also, like, I know this mm -hmm. happened, like, I know this happened in the start, like, a while ago, but I thought it was, like, really sweet that she gave Robert, 
Robert like um the rabbit's foot that says that it was the only thing left from like her old life. I mean, sweet, but also kind of stupid. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But he did give her he he did give her his bracelet in return, so Yeah, yeah. Star, star, star. Nurse Macy was going over her patient charts at the nurse station. She was worried about April's health. She was afraid there was no help for the young girl. Mixed in with her worry about her patient was her worry for Jessica. She hadn't gotten a chance to talk further about the girl's address. But she wasn't going to let it go. Jessica returned to work tomorrow. No more excuses. She just hoped Jessica was having the time of her life at prom. Colin walked up to her. He feels not improving. Her pulse is 30. Her vitals are weak. Fever is still high. Nurse Macy sighed. I know. She's the only one who hadn't made any improvement. It's not good. I just called Father Jeremiah to come and say some prayers on her behalf. It couldn't hurt. Open to any miracle for that young girl. Go update her doctor right away. Suddenly, the hospital door swung open with a loud commotion. Nurse Macy and Colin turned their heads toward the door. Colin sucked in air. What the heck? Jessica? Nurse Macy called out in confusion. Jessica looked terrible. Her face was pale. Brownish liquid streaked down her face from her forehead, eyes, and nose. The liquid had dripped down her neck onto her beautiful dress which they had bought not too long ago. Jessica looked wild, crazed. Nurse Macy stepped forward to ask what had happened, stopped in shock as Jessica ran past her. A few nuts and bolts loaded behind her, scattering. They were followed by the old wrench and a rusty bike pedal that fell to the floor. Nurse Macy's eyes widened as Jessica ran into April's room. We need security, Colin said from Nurse Macy. Then Jessica slammed the door shut. Nurse Macy and Colin scrammed toward the door. It's jammed, Colin spat out, showing Lena to turn the handle. Nurse Macy turned to hit the door with her palm. Jessica, open the door. Talk to me, please. Through the glass of the hospital room. She watched Jessica pull the necklace from her head. It was a pendant she always used, seen her wear. Then she somehow had a knife. Jessica! Jessica began to whittle away the charm above April's head. Hurry, get the door open! Nurse Macy called out the Colin into a security guard. Then Nurse Macy pounded on the glass. Jessica, please! Open the door! I need to see April! Whatever happened, it's going to be okay! I can help you! What's going on? Nurse Macy turned to see his father, Jeremiah. It's Jessica. She locked herself in April's room. We can't get in! Maybe I can help. Just then, the security guard and Colin were able to push the door open, sliding whatever was blocking the door. Thank goodness. Nurse Macy rushed in. She spotted April still asleep in bed. But where was Jessica? Oh, gross, Colin said, pointed to the floor. How did all that get in here? On the floor beside April's bed was a pile of metal pieces, steel bars, gears, bolts, and junkyard garbage. Smelly grease stripped from the pile, as if her blood. What is going on here? Nurse Macy whispered. Could she have gone out the window? Colin asked. He looked out the window, found it locked. Security card checked the restroom. Nurse Macy shook her head bewildered as she turned toward the door. Father Jeremiah, it's because it's gone. Just vanished. I don't understand. She was oh, just here. Yes. Father Jeremiah stepped into the room. He looked down at the pile of metal with a quiet sadness as if he understood something no one else could. Then he made a sign of the cross and began to pray. In that moment, Nurse Macy heard April's heart martyr level out into a strong, healthy rhythm. What? I, uh, I have thoughts. Uh, thoughts that might be able to, like, explain some of this not all of this though uh i do think that the father jeremiah is a jeremy he's one of the jeremys that knows about uh the fnaf stuff um uh, uh otherwise he wouldn't be knowledgeable of um jessica's situation um other um other things um jessica i believe is a robot, uh, not just any robot. You know how um, animatronics in the sister location, they all combined together and made Ennard. Um, Why is I she think dropping just... pieces like car parts and bike pedals? Remember, remember when she was terrified of the junkyard? She came from the junkyard. She is basically like 
an ennard of parts from the junkyard is what I'm going with right now. But it doesn't explain like the magic silver pendant or anything like wait, no, it does. Um she might be injecting um a remnant, I think, on onto the patients to uh, giving her life energy to help them live. But I don't know how Jessica uh like she's just um an amalgamation of parts from the junkyard um into like one entity is basically what uh I'm thinking. My jaw hurts from all that. Um okay, so here's a speculation on the wiki about this about this one because the book's been out for a few days. The pendant that Jessica wears is eerily identical to the heart pendant from Fazbear Fright, specifically to be beautiful and the Stitch Wraith Stingers. Um, I think I have talked about the Stitch Wraith Stingers before, but I don't think I've read to be beautiful. As oh, they to... are both. Hmm? Sorry. To be uh, beautiful was that one with uh, the long neck baby. Uh who cut off pieces of a girl and they were like shoved into a bags. I I don't think I remember reading that one. Was I that th- when you were collecting CD discs? No, you did not read that. I just remember that one was one that Matt Pat read about once. Uh, I think the girl was a different name though. Uh yeah, as they are both silver hearts that have healing properties. So it's probably the same pendant or there are more pendants like it while it's possible this is an alternate version or a completely separate pendant it may be the exact same pendant from fazbear frights if this is true jessica is inadvertently using revenant on the children i told you i told you that's what that's that's what i said that she's using revenant on the children um making them like come back from death and be alive and i think when you use like remnant on them when they're like that freshly dead then they're okay like they can continue to be a living person or Um, when they're like seriously ill and dying like yes yeah as long as like their body is fresh they will be okay they won't be a shambling michael purple guy down the street Um, the pendant not only has the power to heal sickness, but also resurrect the dead, as shown in the beginning. If if the heart pendant is made from remnant, it further supports the idea of William Afton using remnant to gain immortality. Yep, yep, yep. Um, more speculation. Jessica herself is also implied to have some sort of connection towards Eleanor. Don't know who that is. Having a fear of the junkyard, as well as random junk appearing throughout the hospital. It is possible she is one of Eleanor's victims who suffered the same fate as Sarah, being turned into scrapped metal, but using the pendant to keep a human appearance. This is supported by the fact that Droom, after using what is left of her pendant, leaving a pile of junk in her place. Oh, oh, I think Eleanor was the little girl who was possessing baby. Let me double check. Um, let me see. Because it does link to Eleanor. Uh. No, it was, it was Elizabeth. It does have a picture of her next to a variant of baby. Uh, yeah, that's the long, that's the long, uh, giraffe neck baby. Eleanor is the main antagonist of the Fazbear Fright series. She is an entity who feeds off the agony and remnant of others. Her her origins are unknown. She first appeared in To Be Beautiful, the second story of Fazbear Frights 1, Into the Pit. Although she may initially appear to be gentle, thankful, and sweet, 
just the disguise she uses to earn people's sympathy. She is actually an evil and manipulative creature who tends to lie and deceive and shows sociopathic behavior, treating everyone as a slave to reach her goals. She likes to tease and mock her adversaries, winking at Jake after absorbing the evil contained inside the stitch raft and telling Sarah she made her wish come true while she's dying. The only person so far she's shown to have some sort of positive relationship is William Afton, as shown by her giving him the power to create the amalgamation and sustaining him when he was too weak. However, it's unknown whether her connecting with Afton was out of genuine affection towards him or is simply a way to gain something for herself. It's very likely the latter, as she abandons him to die once she gained what she wanted. Huh. And thus, William Afton begins consuming children. Uh-huh. Well, like, there was that one story we read where Afton was, like, in the hospital, and there was someone, like, keeping him well, I think. Until they got, they took him to a, a, a fact, a Fazbear Entertainment factory, and then he just vomited the black goo everywhere. Yeah, yeah, because the story was trying to keep it vague, but it was obviously William. <laughs> well, that so... was royalty. I'm gonna stop the recording now. Okay.